Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Today I'm looking at a brand new locomotive from Helgen. Today's locomotive was a bit of a surprise in every sense really. It was announced at the end of last year right towards the end of production which meant that the model was released very soon after the announcement. Quite a surprise. Also I did not purchase this locomotive, my mum and my granddad actually teamed up and bought this for me for Christmas and I didn't know I was getting it so it was a surprise in that sense as well. So the locomotive is the all new ES1 electric locomotive from Helgen and if you haven't heard of this before as I hadn't a few months ago then stay tuned because the prototype for this model is absolutely fascinating. This particular model is an exclusive to rails and the National Railway Museum's model shop locomotion and as these exclusives often are this is extremely expensive so the price for this is £220 and to give you some context on that that is over £30 more expensive than the Acura Scale Class 92 that I looked at last time and as you know that locomotive was extremely impressive. So in order for this to be considered worth the money, this is going to have to match that Acura Scale Loco in terms of its features and its quality as well. And ideally, this will be an improvement over the likes of Acura Scale to the tune of about £30. Now, this is a Helgen locomotive, and yes, I've had some bad experiences, shall we say, with Helgen Locos in the past. However, I am going into this with an open mind. I try to approach each new locomotive as an individual experience, so I'm not going to let my previous Helgen experiences cloud this model. We're going to take a look at it and I'm going to review it for what it is in its own right. So let's just say my expectations are high and we'll see what the model is like before I say any more. Anyway, let's take a look. It looks fantastic in the images. Let's find out whether it's fantastic in person. So I have actually saved the first unboxing until now, which is obviously a very painful process, but I do it all the time. So I thought I'm still going to do it with this, even though I got it for Christmas. So as you can see, it's in quite a nice coloured box here. Good quality box, nice line drawing on the front. If I show you the end of the box, you can see what we have here. It's number 1204. It's the BR Lakecrest lined green ES1 number 26500. Rails Limited exclusive, and we've got some stats here. It's DCC ready with a next 18 pin decoder socket. Uh, it has working lights, interior lights, NEM couplings, sound ready, so presumably that means a speaker or speakers are fitted, and it is era 5. And if I show you the top of the box and spin it round, you can see a little bit more. So this has museum quality detail, which is a phrase that they always use. And yet I've never noticed any of these exclusives having particularly more detail than standard off the shelf non-exclusives. I don't know. LED cab light and headlights, powerful five pole motor. That's a great feature. It is DCC and sound ready. So again, let's hope for speakers. Fine scale sprung pantograph and also sprung buffers. Ah, my favourite. Let's see what this thing is like then. A reasonably small box this time. And it does seem to have some sort of instructional material with it. Uh, oh, okay. Important note. Let's have a look at this first then. When removing the loco body for maintenance or to install a decoder, please be aware that two metal running plate parts are not fixed in place. Please store safely and reposition the correct way up along the sides of the chassis before refitting the body. So it's an important note, and yet I'm not actually sure what parts it's referring to. So thanks for that, that's terrified me. Um, hopefully that will be obvious later on. North Eastern Railway ES1 user manual. Now I've never seen anything like this from Helgen before. This is awesome. Okay, so locomotive history. That's a great way to start. If you want to pause and read a bit more about the class, feel free to. And I think there's even more over on this side, along with a nice line drawer in there. Okay, so here we've got some sort of parts diagram. A little bit difficult to interpret, but at least it has all of the parts listed. On the next page, oh, this is a little bit more useful. I guess that gives you more idea of where all the different parts are located, so that's decent. All right, servicing and DCC information. Right, so removing the body, yep, you've got to remove four screws. We'll, we'll take a look at that later on. 
conversion to digital yep okay so that shows where the decoder goes looking further down it talks about dcc sound and it says that it's been designed with a small space inside the body to install a sugar cube speaker well I was under the impression that this loco would have a speaker already, given the price and given the fact that Sound Ready was plastered all over the box. That's a bit of a disappointment. And then we've got some technical data, 12 volt motor with flywheels, that's good. Gears to all axles, that's as you'd expect. Wiper pickups, nice and standard. 12 volt DC analog, next 18. And you've got a couple of the lighting functions, which is just headlights and cab lights, very simple and we've even got some dimensions of the loco there which is really cool and then on the back we've got a little bit more information it does say this should be able to handle second radius curves or possibly even tighter so i shouldn't have any problems with this on my setup all right so with that let's take a look inside so we've got this foam packaging which is pretty much becoming the standard these days isn't it let's pull that out and take a look so there is the loco uh, i did see one of these at Wally but I'd forgotten how tiny it was. Yeah, this is a really, really small loco, isn't it? And again, a fascinating one. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the history on this thing in a moment. Really, really interesting. Okay, well, let's pull it out and see. The weight at the moment seems okay, I would say, for something as small as this is. Uh, it seems to be reasonably hefty. Right, so we've got a very, very sparse looking accessories bag here which literally just includes a pair of screw link couplings. So if you wanted to fit those to the buffer beams, you could do. So that's a lovely feature. I do like when models come with those. Let's have a look at the Loco then. Standard sort of packaging. Oh gosh. Wow, so the first thing I'm noticing is the finish. This has got a quality finish that is very similar to that of Backman and Acura scales. Yeah, really nice sort of satin sheen to it. Not too glossy, but certainly not matte either. Yeah, that looks awesome. Right, ready to lift then. Let's see what this thing is like. I'm going to be quite careful with this. All right, here it is. And yeah, it is seriously quite heavy. And the reason is, I'm pretty sure the body here is die cast. Yeah, at least the bonnets here, they are definitely metal. You can just feel that when you touch them. I think the steeple cab part, I think that's possibly plastic, but even so, that die cast gives this model the weight that it needs. That is amazing. The sole bar or the running plate also seems to be die cast. And at a glance, I would say the level of detail here looks superb. It really does look good. So, really looking forward to seeing this loco up close and personal. I'll talk to you a bit more about the details when I do that. But for now, it's time for a bit more background on this very, very interesting loco. The North Eastern Class ES-1 was comprised of just two locomotives commissioned in 1902, surprisingly early for electric locomotives. The engines were intended for use on the short railway line from Trafalgar Yard to Newcastle Quayside Yard, a short but treacherous line owing to the steep gradients and the three tunnels. The gradients combined with these tunnels made operating the stretch with steam locomotives extremely challenging. The engines would struggle and they would also produce choking fumes in the tunnels which was obviously not great for those working on the locomotives. Thus, these locomotives were commissioned and the expectations for them were formidable. They had to be able to shift 150 tonnes of freight from a standstill on the steepest part of the line and of course as electrics they would do this without producing any choking fumes. When initially built they were designed for third rail and overhead line operation though the overhead collectors were initially located on the bonnets of the loco. It wouldn't be until a few years after that a pantograph would be installed on the roof. Amazingly, these ancient locomotives were used in operation right up until 1964, when they were finally replaced by diesels. Number one has been preserved, while number two sadly was scrapped. The remaining example is currently on display at Locomotion in Shildon, hence its appearance here in the National Collection in Miniature Range. So there it is, up close and personal for you, the brand new ES1 Electric from Helgen. And as I think is fairly clear, this thing is amazing. I really do like this model. It's such a strange prototype, isn't it? And you've really got to take your hats off to rails and locomotion for commissioning such a loco. It's not the sort of thing you'd expect to see produced, and yet here it is. And looking at it, I think it was well worth it. So glad to have something like this in the collection. 
The quality, I would say, is also good. It's probably the best quality Helgen Loco I have in the collection. I do love the use of metal. The die-cast bonnets here really add a lot to the weight, and the finish on those parts is excellent as well. And there's quite good use of metal in some of the detailing too, as we're going to see. The quality is not perfect. I would say there's too much paint on some components. If we look at this area here, I would say this is where the paint is applied correctly. The details stand out, the rivets and everything looks really good. If we look over at the other side, I would say this area has received too much paint. Some of the rivets are starting to get lost and the definition in that circular vent is really kind of lost. So that's a little bit unprofessional, although I would say the actual decoration and the lining and everything, as we'll see in a moment, is top notch. One or two of the details look a little bit twisted and bent out of position. This could have happened in transit, I suppose, although do bear in mind the packaging was good quality. Yeah, quite a nastily bent lamp bracket there, and quite a few of those have a little bit of paint missing off them. But in general, I would say that's pretty much it. The build quality overall is high, definitely. So let's start by taking a look at the decoration and the paintwork. I love this sort of minty green colour. It's this sort of unique colour that really sells a loco for me. I like that a lot. And the black and white lining is really excellent. I love the way this looks. And it's being produced to a very, very high standard. I can't see any issues with the lining there. And there's quite a lot of it, as you'll see looking around the loco. You've got the British Railways crest here with the running number on it, and then a much older looking logo. I guess, is that the Northeastern logo? Maybe the close up lens will do a better job of showing that. The buffer beams are separately painted as well, and I have to say the buffers look particularly good because the buffer shafts have almost sort of chrome colour to them, whereas the actual heads of the buffers seem to be blackened, and that gives them a really, really realistic fine look. And these are sprung while we're on the subject. Yep, sprung buffers. The die-cast sole bar as well has some decoration on it, just some minor printing on there, but again, it helps to sell the illusion. Let's take a look at some of the detail then, and we'll start at the bottom. The bogey detail is exceptional. I would say the fidelity in the moulding here is high, very, very high. It's also complete with separately fitted real chains. This is something we're seeing quite a lot of these days on new models, and I think they really enhance a loco. It's a great little detail. You've also got the, what I assume are the pickup shoes for when this loco would run on the third rail. You've got a lot of underframe detail as well, as you can see, a lot going on here. You've got separately fitted steps. These are quite fragile and they kind of are where your fingers want to go to pick up the loco. So you really need to sort of lift it up a little bit higher or even better lift the bonnets because there, yeah, they do flex under the fingers. You've got separately fitted pipework or possibly wiring as an electric along the sole bar there, which all seems to be nice and fine. And there's a lot of metal handrails along the bodywork as well, all fitted very, very accurately. You've got the handrails aside the door where there's a lot of moulded detail, actually. The body is very detailed. At each end, you've got this lamp, which clearly does have an LED inside it, so hopefully those are going to work. Looks like the LED itself is actually right there in the lamp. It's not some fibre optic connection, so we should get some decent brightness there. And then we've also got what look like water filler caps. Now, they're not going to be for fuel, are they? So presumably water, maybe? Is there a cooling system that uses the water? I'm not sure. That would be my guess. I'm not an expert on the prototype. The steeple cab itself has what looks like a whistle. Now, if that's a steam whistle, maybe that's the, the reason for the water. There is some very lovely flush glazing around the cab, which allows you to see inside, where there's a bit of detail. It's not particularly detailed inside, but there are one or two details. I think the thing that lets it down for me is that the cab floor is noticeably really high, and for some reason they've put a wooden plank texture on it, which draws your eye to it and also to the fact that it's quite unrealistically high. So I suppose a slightly disappointing cab, not that high in the way of detail or realism, but then again, obviously this loco has to work and I think the motor must be under there. Presumably the motor is centrally mounted, so maybe they didn't have too much choice in that matter. 
The roof has a great finish on it, as does the rest of the model, but it's particularly noticeable on the roof. And then you've got this extremely fine and detailed pantograph, which is clearly made up of quite a lot of different parts here. Most of the metal, unlike the Acura Scale Class 92, which looks very plasticky, yeah, you can see all of the springs and such on there, and they're all real. They all appear to work. So I'm now going to try to release the pantograph very carefully. There we go. Um, it's not straight. Let me see if I can... Oh, no, I'm not going to mess around with that. So it's... Um, a flimsy thing to say the least. I'm not sure if you'd want to actually run this along some overhead lines or not. I think it would I think it would just sort of move, wouldn't it? Unless the real thing did that. I don't know. So yeah, that is a flimsy thing, but I guess that's the nature of the beast. I'm gonna try and put that down safely. There we go. So there you have it. The level of detail I would say is pretty high, and the quality also is pretty high but I haven't seen anything that would remotely justify that £220 price tag. The level of detail is fairly standard, and I'm not really seeing any features in particular that makes me think, wow, that must have cost a lot to achieve. But maybe I'll change my mind when I take a look inside the Loco. Maybe there are a lot more features hidden away. So now let's move on to the performance test. We'll see how this runs. We'll see how it handles itself on the track. Obviously, expectations are high here as well. It needs to be a good performer. And then, of course, we'll take a look at the mechanism and see what makes this thing tick on the inside. So far, pretty impressed. I'm enjoying this one. Let's get it onto the track. So there she is down onto the track, the brand new ES1 from Helgen looking amazing. And I have to say how glad I am to have gotten the green one. I do much prefer this looking at the photos. The first performance test has already been filmed and I will show you that in just a second. After that, I went on and did a look at the mechanism and as always, that's what I'm gonna talk about first. Surprisingly from Helgen, the mechanism is decent quality. It ticks most of the boxes and it all comes together to be a reasonably good quality mechanism. As usual from Helgen though, in my opinion, this still suffers from poor instructions and a few bad design decisions. For example, the bogey bases are again just clipped into position, they're not screwed. And the positioning of these clips right at the end of the bogies, kind of behind the wheels, makes it very, very difficult to remove these bases for servicing. Particularly when the instructions themselves say that you should be inspecting these models uh, for debris and fluff and such to ensure good running. Removing the plate reveals a plastic bogey chassis without any bearings on it, or so it seems. Actually, there are bearings. You have these axle point pickups, which kind of double as bearings. Now, I wasn't expecting that because it's clearly stated in the instructions that the pickups are wiper pickups and these are not. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The axle base pickups work absolutely fine usually, but I guess it is the first clue that whoever wrote these instructions doesn't actually know the model at all. The only other thing is that these bearings are fitted to the detail parts that fit to the sides of the bogey. These are usually just cosmetic and they are just kind of friction fitted in place. But this time they're not cosmetic, they are actually supporting the axles by the looks of things. Anyway, body removal. Now according to the instructions it should be remarkably simple. In fact, just two steps. The first one being to remove the four screws. Well, how? <laughs> The screws are actually buried underneath the bogey detail, completely hidden. How were you meant to get to those screws? So I tried disassembling the bogey. I tried to take some of those detail parts off on the side, but some of the detail started to fall out. So I decided, nope, I'm not going to do that. In the end, I managed to find a super fine screwdriver, which I was able to force between the bogey detail. Not very nice to have to do and then I was able to undo the screws, but have fun putting the screws back in. I mean, again, they're completely covered. Bad design choice. Don't put screws directly under the bogies in the middle. If they've got to go under the bogies, put them at one of the ends so that you can swing the bogey left and right to access the screw. That's super, super annoying. So the body comes off to reveal a die-cast chassis, which is a good quality feature. Like I say, loads of weight on this model, weight not a problem at all. These are the pieces that that warning note mentioned. Um, yeah, indeed, they are not fitted to the model and they do drop off when the body is removed. 
I have no idea why these are not fitted to the model. I think they could have easily just had a dab of glue put onto them. Maybe it was just done to add even more whimsical inconvenience to the model. So the next confusing thing is this. Look, there is a speaker, and I did remove this speaker housing to verify that there was a speaker inside it. Now again, that goes completely against what the instructions said, because in there they recommend placing a speaker inside the space provided, as the small size of the locomotive means that alternative position. It goes on and on. That's not relevant because there's a speaker pre-fitted. Um, it says that there's a space inside the body to install a sugar cube speaker, but that there is already one there. So if I wanted sound, and I'd read that in the instructions, I at this point would have gone out and bought a speaker, probably before dismantling the loco. And to then find a speaker pre-fitted is just a bit baffling. Why couldn't the instructions have just said that, instead of going on about, oh, this is where the speaker should go? It doesn't make any sense. Frankly, the only thing worse than instructions that don't give enough information is instructions that give the wrong information. I don't know how this has happened. I guess maybe the instructions might have been written before the design was finalised. I don't know, but there's all sorts of stuff like that where it just, the instructions don't match the loco. Anyway, back to the loco. You do have plunger contacts for the lights, which is great because there are no wires in the way when you remove the body. And there is the next 18-pin decoder socket, which is there exactly as the instructions said it would be. The motor is buried underneath the cab area, you can't really get a good look at that, but the flywheels are slightly visible, very small flywheels, but they are there nonetheless. In terms of the gauge, it comes in at 14.3 to 14.4, slight range between those two values, but that's absolutely fine, that's quite near to the standard. So the quality of the mechanism, generally speaking, is quite high. It does have all of the features that I tend to look for, and the build quality of it is definitely okay. It's more the instructions which don't actually aid you at all in using your locomotive, they're not useful, and also the accessibility and the serviceability of the model, which leaves a bit to be desired, but not to a, a horrific extent as we've seen before. Okay, let's move on and I'll show you the performance test. Okay, here goes then. It is time to test the performance. So I think everything's ready. I'll set the controller for forwards direction. First question, as always, does the loco work? So I'm going to give it some juice and see if it does. You can see the lights are coming on. Yep, yep, it's going. There we go, that's 50% speed. Now, it did actually say on the instructions this time that running in is necessary or bedding in, I think was the term they used. Obviously, this is literally the first run this Loco's ever done. It hasn't had that running in yet, so it will be getting that before I pass a final judgment on the performance. But straight away, I mean, it seems to be working. Uh, I would say it's fairly smooth. I'm not seeing any evidence of any cogging at this sort of speed. And the gearing seems to be sensible. That is 50. Yeah, that doesn't seem bad at all. Let me show you the lighting then. So the lighting is directional, so the headlamps only come on when the locomotive is going in that direction. And then you've got the internal cab light, which appears to come on regardless of the loco direction, which I think makes sense. And uh, it perfectly illuminates that uh, unrealistically high cab floor, which is a shame, but still it's quite nice to have some lights on inside. I think overall that's a good feature. All right, so yeah, it seems to be nice and smooth. Let's see if there's any torque there in the mechanism. It's quite a heavy loco, so it could potentially pull quite a bit if there's torque, up to 50. Yeah, it's turning its wheels without any problems. So there's torque there, that's great. Uh, let's have a look at the slow speed then, back it up a little bit, and I'm now gonna ease it up very, very gently, and we'll see if we can get a crawl. Again, I would expect this to improve uh, as running in continues, but straight out of the box. Turning up a bit more. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, for a heavy loco that's not been run in, that's not a bad crawl. It is stalling a little bit. Yeah, it jerks along a bit at that speed, but again, this is fresh out of the box. So I think what we need to do is let this run. We'll send it around the layout, check how it gets on around the various curves and such. And then once it's fully running, we'll come back and do some of these tests again. All right, here we go, 50%. So already I would say it's picked up a little bit of speed just on the few feet that it's run. Uh, it's still sensible though. 
you know this is a really early electric locomotive intended for freight as i understand it for the most part so i think the speed the loco runs at at half power definitely reflects that quite sensibly in terms of the consistency it seems pretty good i did not see it slow down over that second radius which is good um, it's reasonably quiet, although there is a bit of a sort of prickling noise coming from it, which I'm not sure what that means, but that's kind of what it sounds like. Not a problem, though. doesn't seem to be any issue in the way this loco runs. Okay, so I'm going to leave this to it. It's going to have 30 minutes forwards like this, then I'll reverse the direction, go back, and then I'll return to you and we'll do some more tests. Okay, there we go, running in is complete. And yeah, I think the loco is a bit faster now, um, slightly, let me show you this. There you go. But for the most part, the gearing still seems very, very sensible. And at the slightly slower speeds, if you want to be even more realistic, I don't know, maybe something like that, still nice and smooth, isn't it? So performance is great, not had any issues, uh, the pickups, seem to be working fine they're not wiper pickups but the actual pickups they seem to be absolutely fine no cutting out no slowing down either on the curves that's a good thing seems to be a good reliable loco so let's have a look and see what the crawl is like it was a touch coggy before wasn't it so let's see if that's any better i'm going to ease this up gently we'll try it in both directions it started to move and then stopped so let's give it a bit more yeah, okay, so it is kind of inching forward. It is very slow, don't get me wrong. This is quite an impressive crawl, but uh, it's not particularly smooth. Let's keep going. Okay, so it's, again, it's cogging at that speed, isn't it? Let's go a bit further until it's smooth. There, now I'd say it's smooth, sort of. Yeah, so again, I think we've seen better, but there's not enough here to complain about, really. And in reverse, yeah, it's not the smoothest motion in the world but it's absolutely fine. And this is on analog. Obviously your mileage might vary on DCC. Yeah, it is, it's a pleasing loco. It works as it should, which is the main thing. Yeah, I like that. Very nice. Okay, so pulling power then. Well, it's a heavy loco, so unsurprisingly, it's a decent hauler. 0 0.38 newtons, that is around 24 coaches on straight and level track. That's quite a lot more than several much larger locos than this, so that's fine. So to test its haulage capacity, I've set up a good load of wagons. This should hopefully test the loco under a load and we'll also be able to test the couplings. So let's see how that goes. Let's go and couple up. As always, I'm going to try and make this as controlled as I possibly can do. Okay, I failed. <laughs> that was my fault, to be fair. My thumb went the other way, but I think you can tell, yeah, you've got a good level of control over this thing does jerk about a bit at these speeds but not too badly right let's put it under load let's go i think we'll go for yeah probably about 50 still looks good to me i think oh it seems to be shifting them easily as it ought to that's very good all right so elsewhere on the line i have a few other electrics the first one is quite an old-fashioned one but nowhere near as old-fashioned as the es1 so this is the class 71 from hornby and I guess it is a relatively early electric, isn't it, on the grand scheme of things. And then on the inside line, we have an even earlier electric from Helgen again, actually. It's the Metropolitan Bobo, which is kind of similar, isn't it? Unusual looking design, very early, but also quite attractive. So there we go. See what other electrics you can spot on the layout. And there is, as always, an odd one out. All right, let's see how it gets on now. It's got a load around the second radius there without any issues. So really, just like the Acura Scale 92, this thing handles a load as though it isn't coupled up to anything at all. It just didn't slow down at all. It doesn't seem to be hesitating. So again, that suggests that the mechanism's got some great torque. That's good to see, you know. It's a heavy, heavy loco, very small. Not a lot of space for a mighty mechanism inside this one. And yet it's still got one. <laughs> so yeah, that's really good. The performance is surprisingly good. Very, very reliable, this one. The other thing I love about this is the lighting. The lights are quite bright, which isn't everybody's cup of tea. I know some people prefer more subtle lighting in their locomotives, but I quite like it. And on this loco, the brightness means that the light kind of reflects off that high shine bonnet on each end of the loco, which just looks really, really pleasing. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous effect. 
So overall I'm quite happy with this. I think it cost an awful lot of money and I don't think I've really seen enough features and quality and detail to justify that extremely high price tag. But if you ignore the price, it is a decent loco. It ticks most of the boxes. It looks fantastic. The level of detail is good. And the set of features is absolutely adequate. Like, I don't really want multiple speakers. I don't particularly want a motorized pantograph that goes up and down by itself. The features this loco has got are absolutely fine. I wouldn't want it to have any more. It's just, to my mind, given its relative simplicity compared with some of the more complex models out there, it just doesn't need to cost £220. That's my opinion anyway. Do let me know what you think. Do you think this is worth it? Do you think there are unforeseen costs involved in production that I might not have considered? Please do let me know. Let's do some ratings then on the all-new ES1 Electric from Helgen. So the level of detail has to be 4.5 to me. It's very, very nearly a 5. It's got all of the bells and whistles, lights that are nice and noticeable, cab detail, excellent decoration, loads of separately fitted parts, including chains, sprung buffers. The only thing that lets it down is the cab floor being so high up, slightly unrealistically so, and the cab detail itself isn't great. Besides that, it is a beautifully detailed loco, and the underframe is particularly impressive as well. Again, the performance is very, very near to perfect. It's great, it's smooth, the speed is sensible, it's really powerful, as we're about to see, but it is a tiny bit coggy at the lower speeds, and there is a speed sort of between a crawl and a slowish run where it gets really quite coggy. Not a huge problem at all, but I have knocked off half a star for that. The pulling power cannot be faltered, 24 coaches or 0.38 newtons of tractive effort. That's more than a Hornby 8F or a Hornby King class. Very impressive for what this is. The mechanism actually is quite good. I mean, technically it does have the bearings because of the axle point pickups. It's got the five pole motor, it's got the flywheels, even a speaker. It's just the accessibility and the serviceability really quite annoying, particularly in the body removal, which you will have to do if you want to put your own decoder in there. But still, yeah, a decent mechanism for a Helgen, quite impressive, four star. The quality, again, to an extent, this is quite impressive. The amount of die cast and metal on here is really, really good, and that extends to detailing such as the handrails and also the pantograph. However, the paint in places wasn't great. We've got too much paint on some of the parts. You've got some wonky parts, mainly the lamp brackets. I think it's putting the body on that does that because the body nubbed another one of those lamp brackets when I was replacing the body after I filmed the mechanism section. So I think that's what is going on with that. Also, the instructions, not very good. They're not accurate. And the section on removing the body doesn't actually help you to do that. We've seen that before from Helgen. Again, the pantograph also, quite flimsy. I like that it's made of metal and it certainly looks good, but when it's in the raised position, it just kind of flops all over the place. I don't suppose it's supposed to. But it really is the value for money that I think lets this one down. So this costs £220, that is the price, and I've given that two star, and perhaps that's even generous, because that's £13 more than I paid for the new Hornby 9F. It is £30 more than I paid for the new Acura Scale Class 92, and it is £95 more than I paid for the new Backman Class 20. All these locos are larger with similar or more features. At the very least, at 220 quid, this loco should have been perfect in quality. It wasn't quite. Now, this is quite a niche model, and perhaps for you that will add value, but to me, it doesn't really. I look at the model I have, I look at what it has to offer in a tangible sense, and for me, £220 is not representative of this loco. That's my opinion anyway. So overall, that is a score of 7.44 out of 10, or a grade of C. And into the logbook it goes, second place below the Acura Scale Class 92. Yeah, overall, this is a great model of a really cool prototype. Overall, the number of complaints are few. The biggest one has to be the price. This is a fairly standard model in terms of detail and features, yet it has an extraordinary price tag, which doesn't match it. Well, folks, that is the end of another review. I hope you enjoyed this one. This has been a completely unique locomotive to look at. I've never reviewed another loco that is remotely similar to this one, so what an awesome experience this was. And I do think, yeah, I think this is possibly the best Helgen Loco I have in my collection. It has a lot more finesse and, yeah, a lot more quality 
than some of the other Helgen Locos I've looked at in the past. It's not absolutely amazing, and I do think the likes of Acura Scale and Backman even uh, are producing higher quality models, but like I say, I do think it is the best example of a Helgen Loco I have. So, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about this Loco. Have you got one? Are you thinking of getting one? Have you decided against it? Uh, whatever the case may be, please let me know in the comments, and I'd be very interested to hear. For now though, thank you again for watching and I will see you again very soon for another review. Alright, cheers folks, take care.